I see Governor Walker has returned, and uh, so we'll resume. Uh, the chairman will return shortly. I did this for six years, so I might be able to work my way through this till he gets back. Uh, first of all, uh, Governor Walker, uh, I, I really appreciate you mentioning Mitch Daniels. Uh, he's my governor, and uh, we think he's done one hell of a job. And uh, we're proud that uh, you think so as well. Uh, and he did a lot of the things that uh, you have tried to do in Wisconsin by executive order. And as you said very clearly, uh, the state is in good fiscal condition. Uh, he's done an outstanding job, and uh, uh, we're very proud of him. And that's why he got reelected by such a large majority. So, and he he won uh, reelection at a time that, uh, for the first time since 1964. We lost the state to the Democrat candidate, Mr. Obama, for president. So it shows you against the tide he did very well. I would like to ask you, Governor Shimlin, um, you don't have a, a balanced budget requirement in your state. No, we do not. Yeah. And, and, and you are going to adopt a single-payer uh, system for, for health care? We are trying, yes. And how are you going to pay for that? Well, our challenge in health care reform across the country and uh, both Federal and State, in my judgment, has been that no one has gotten cost containment right. So our first challenge is to design a system where we are using our dollars more efficiently and ensuring that we are spending less on health care. We are going to pay for it once we figure out how to get cost containment right, and that is a real challenge, as you know. Uh, we are then going to figure out the best publicly financed method to pay for it, and that decision will be made in 2013. Yeah. Have you, are you familiar with the, uh, the situation in Tennessee with their plan or the situation in Massachusetts with their plan? Uh, I am not clear what you are alluding to. Well, I mean, they went to a, 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 a program that is not exactly like yours, but uh, similar. The government was uh, going to control the health care and, and the expenditures and that sort of thing. Well, I can tell you that I, I don't study Massachusetts and uh, and other states uh, as much as I study Vermont. And frankly, we've already done that. Uh, we have Dr. Dinosaurs, which covers all our children. Uh, the Republican governor Jim Douglas passed Cat Amount, which covers you up to 300 percent of poverty with a great benefits package. We have VHAP, Vermont Health Access. So no one has better access, I don't believe, with the exception of maybe Massachusetts than the state of Vermont. So my challenge is that. We have done access. We now have a cost problem. They are doubling every 10 years. It is driving businesses and middle class Americans who are paying more and more money for less and less insurance. We think we can get it right in Vermont. Without raising taxes? Well, the point is we are raising taxes right now because health care premiums are going up so quickly, the tax being money coming out of Vermonters' pockets at a higher rate than they can earn for rising health care costs. I pay it as a business person when I give my employees health insurance. It is a health care tax. Rising costs are a tax on business and a huge hindrance to job creation. So you, you probably will have a tax increase? No, we won't have a tax increase. What we will do is design a system where we spend less on health care than we are spending now and find a way to pay for it where it follows the individual as not isn't required by the employer. The tax increase now is coming from the rate at which health care costs are growing about twice of our income. So that is what we are trying to fix. Well, but I understand there is going to be an offset there, but how, how do you make the offset? I mean, you have got to have the money to, to, to offset the rising cost of health care. How are but you going to get it? We are going to reduce the rising cost of health care. We are getting the money right now. No, no, I understand that. But if you can't reduce the rising cost, let us say it if doesn't we, work. If we, if we can't reduce the cost, we won't pass the bill. You won't pass the bill. That is right. So you, you won't have a tax increase. We will. Our goal is to pay less for health care and ensure that we are delivering quality health care to all Vermonters without the waste. Where are we well, I, I understand, and, 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 and you are a very good politician. You are skating the issue. You are not saying you will not raise taxes, but if necessary, you probably would have to. Uh, what I am saying is that we are paying the tax right now. It is on my business. It is on every business in Vermont. It is every Vermonter I, I understand, paying Governor. for the premium. You, you, I can see how you got elected, Governor. You are sharp. Uh, let me just say, uh, uh, Governor Walker, uh, I don't see how 
uh, the local municipalities in your state who are facing rising costs could possibly have survived without huge property tax increases, other tax increases, uh, unless you did what you did. And so uh, I was very happy that you had the perspicacity to hang in there uh, when, uh, when uh, you had those problems. I would just like to ask you now, uh, I know this is before the court, your Supreme Court. Do you have any idea when they are going to make a ruling on your case? Well, it has been appeals been made to the Supreme Court right now, uh, very, very well may be likely today. The Circuit Court uh, mentioned yesterday they may even by today or tomorrow uh, put forth a ruling on the original issue on the open uh, meetings law. Uh, but one way or the other probably will end up in the Supreme Court, but it could be as early as this week. And that will probably be a close vote, I would imagine, on the Supreme Court. It is hard to tell. I am not a lawyer, uh, but I, when I was in the legislature, I had the audacity to actually read the legislation I voted on, so sometimes I was accused of being a lawyer. Uh -uh. Uh, but uh, um, but, but I have read the statutes, um, and in this case, uh, the, the law is pretty clear. Yeah. And I think in the end, whether it is the Circuit Court, the Court of Appeals, or the Supreme Court, ultimately, uh, the rule in favor of the legislature, and, and I have said all along, it is not if this will be the law, it is when. Yeah. They are providing a speed reading course for members of Congress so they can read 2,500 pages in one 24-hour period. So I am happy that you in Wisconsin was uh, reading the bills. As I understand it, uh, the State and local governments, uh, you asked the employees to contribute 5.8 uh, percent to their pensions and 12.6 uh, percent to their health care premiums. And uh, the current uh, private sector employees are paying about 20 percent. So what you were talking about was substantially less, even though you were having an increase in it, substantially less than what the, um, what the private sector was paying. That is correct. Middle class taxpayers in our state are paying more, and they are also on top of that paying for the government that they will have to pay for. Now, do you have, uh, you don't have a, do you have a merit pay system, merit pay system in, in Wisconsin? Uh, we, we have a civil service protection system where we have some benefits for those non-represented employees, but we don't have the same things uh, under the uh, under those individuals who are under who are represented employees. This would allow us to do that not only at the state level, uh, but ultimately at the local level, which is particularly important in schools, cities, towns, counties, so forth. We could pay for performance, and that would be exceptional. Very good. Well, I see the uh, boss is back, so I'll turn the chair back to him, and I yield Thank back. Thank you, Representative Burton. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady Mr. Chairman, from the District of Columbia. Mr. Chairman, uh, the ranking member is recognized. I just asked unanimous consent that uh, Ms. Norton be given seven seven minutes, as was uh, Mr. Burton. He just took seven minutes. I just want to make sure we got equal time. That's all. Uh, absolutely. I've uh, we have run over on almost every person, uh, but certainly uh, I expect that the next speaker may run over in a similar right. period of time. The gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Thank you, thank you both. Um, we, we, we ha I'm, I'm very grateful for both of you to, to come this morning because uh, you present us with a contrast uh, in approaches of running a, a state government in hard times. And I certainly want you to know that I recognize that there would be di great differences between uh, your two states. Uh, both of you, though, come from states with um, a history of strong unions and collective bargaining. So in, in, in an important way, in an important way, are comparable. But of course, there's been quite different results with those unions. Uh, you are facing something of a backlash, Governor Walker, and court cases, and all the rest of it. I do want you to know that um, I believe you faced uh, a, a terribly serious situation for a new governor to come in uh, and be faced with what you, and for that matter, Governor Schulman, were faced with. Is is nothing to uh, to to, uh, to 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 do to do anything but take seriously. There's certainly no more funds from the federal government as your predecessor had, and we're not mitigating anything for you out there. Um, and uh, it cuts up proceeding here. Now there are warnings that we could face a double dip. I'm telling you, that's what happened in 1937. Uh, the history books tell us that. Uh, 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 President Roosevelt uh, experienced something of a backlash uh, to his spending to get out of the Great Recession. And uh, then in 1937, they called 
uh, the results, the Roosevelt Depression. So I think the states, are, the states don't even have what we have. I, I would like to, to, to ask you, Governor Walker, have you yet uh, met with your union, uh, top union leaders? As has been the practice in the past, the head of the Office of State Employee Relations, Greg Gratz, has talked to them about how we move forward from this point. Wouldn't it be good to see, is now that, that you, 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 you come out of the worst of, of the fight, uh, to seek a meeting with them so as, as uh, to avoid, uh, to mend as much of the, of the breach as you could? Again, on, on not only this issue, but on where the employee contracts go forward from this point, that is why uh, Mr. Grott set up that meeting. And on other issues beyond just the, uh, uh, just the public employee contracts, but with uh, the head of the AFL-CIO, for example, on issues related to unemployment compensation and changes that need to be made in the future or may need to be made, uh, we have an unemployment compensation council, and both he yeah, and you the are, You are the head of the government. You're this right. was. The, you had the press conferences. You called the shot. Uh, th these people are not going away. Um, you would not have to be engaged in negotiation with them or in the details, but a simple meeting would not, not send a, a signal to the State that you at least had reached out in hope for better relations in the, in the future. Well, my better relations at this point have been with the workers of the state. I have reached out and talked to Many workers. Many of the workers are, in, fa in fact, uh, represented. And unless they believe that uh, their unions have a better relationship, I don't know why in the world they would figure that somehow you could jump over them and have a better relationship, given uh, what has already happened to them, Governor Walker. Well, again, the common practice in the past is to work through the position that Mr. Gratz has right now. All right, Mr. Governor Walker, I see that you are just where you were. It is what, what, what happened in the past that led to the most serious breach a governor has had uh, with his workers in memory. Let me ask uh, Governor Schuman, um, have you uh, um, uh, met with, uh, you have also had hard times in your state. Um, uh, and let me see if the figures I have been given are correct, uh, that the State employees voted to accept a two-year 3 percent cut, that the teachers uh, are agreeing to three additional years of work before retiring and to contribute a greater percentage of their pay toward their pensions, and pensions are at the root of much of the trouble of the States that your State Employees Association have voted to increase the pension contribution by 1.3 percent over the next five years? How, 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 have you got, how have you been able to get unions uh, to give up so much and, and apparently uh, to, to maintain some kind of relationship with collective bargaining in your State? Well, Congressman Norton, I, you know, I think you got to the heart of it right in the beginning of your comments. Uh, the first thing that I did as Governor, after getting sworn in that very day, was call the Vermont State Employees Association, our State Employee Union, into the office and tell them that I needed to make $12 million worth of additional cuts and I wanted their cooperation through hiring freezes and other methods which are not part of the list of concessions. Did you threaten with. them if they didn't? I absolutely didn't threaten them. I said, we got to work together to solve this problem. And guess what? They stood with us and we have made the cuts. In fact, we have exceeded the 12 million target that we need to get for this fiscal year. My point is, uh, I have seen both examples. In the last eight years, we had a Republican governor who never invited the teachers union up to his office and therefore turned to the speaker and myself to get the concessions on the 25 million from them. My point is that reasonableness, compromise, common sense, that is what the American people are looking for. But what they are looking for more than anything is for us to all sit around the table together to solve real problems. We have done that in Vermont. I know that other governors are doing it. I think we all will be well served by that approach. Governor Walker, I, um, I would be so presumptuous as to give you, uh, to give you any advice. You, you, are, you know your, your situation better than any of us. But if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, use um, an analogy uh, based on relationships here in the Congress. You are aware that the Congress is considered to be very polarized. Now, the Chairman and I are on very different sides when it comes to matters affecting 
national policy and affecting even the District of Columbia. Uh, but when I have had a disagreement with him, while I have not recruited him to my position, I have uh, always felt that this was somebody I could talk with and that we would have a civil conversation. I am known to be combative, sir. I represent people who, don't eat, who have a vote in this committee but don't have any vote on the House, House floor second per capita in Federal income taxes. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't say I never want to speak to these Republicans who are going to vote for this congressional resolution coming up. Uh, I, I, so I don't, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I do want to know I am in the minority here. And whether I was in the minority or the majority, and even though we vote off in party line, we we maintain good relationships. Analogizing that to your situation, after you have had a tough fight with a bunch of unions, uh, I would want to take the high road and say, I am the big guy here. I am calling you in. This is why I did it. I hope things go better in the future uh, and, and be done with it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the, the gentlelady. We have a vote. I do not want to hold the governors over. So we have two people left present who have not uh, spoken. I am going to ask you to be at or below five minutes so that you both can get in and then we will recess this panel and we thank the Governor. So, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank both you gentlemen for not only your patience, but your very thoughtful responses. I am concerned that there appears to be a systematic attack on American workers, and part of that attack seemed to be designed to blame them for fiscal challenges facing the States. Governor Shumlin, in your testimony, you attribute State budget shortfalls not to American workers, but to an, I quote, the greatest economic recession since the Great Depression, end of it. As you stated, our revenues are down and the need for government services is up. Is that an accurate uh, depiction? Absolutely. The Washington Post columnist Ezra Klein explained the same point with respect to Wisconsin, indicated whatever fiscal problems Wisconsin is or is not facing at the moment, they are not caused by labor unions. That is also true for New Jersey, for Ohio, and for the other states. There was no sharp rise in collective bargaining in 2006 and 7. no major reforms of the country's labor laws, no dramatic change in how unions organize, and yet the State budgets collapsed. Revenues plummeted, taxes had to go up, and spending had to go down all across the country. Blame the banks, blame global capital flows, blame lax regulation of Wall Street, blame home buyers or home sellers, but don't blame the unions, not for this recession. Governor Walker, how do you respond to, to that view? Thank you, Representative, for your question. As I mentioned earlier in my testimony, I think there are a number of reasons that brought at least Wisconsin to a $3.6 billion deficit. One, like Vermont and other states, is the economy, no doubt about it. And, and I, you mentioned a bunch of different reasons that people have uh, uh, acknowledged were part of the recession. I won't get into the details of that, but tell you that one significant part, uh, without a doubt, is the economy. And that is why we are working so hard to improve that and show that Wisconsin indeed is open for business, so future budgets are easy to, easier to tackle. In our state, though, beyond that, and something I have acknowledged is not a partisan issue, it has been Democrats and Republicans alike in the past have deferred tough decisions. Uh, for 16 years, the last eight biennial budgets, and, and it goes back before that probably, but for at least 16 years since the state started measuring the structural deficit, uh, state lawmakers and past governors have deferred tough, tough decisions by rating things like the transportation fund or the patient compensation fund in our state, by pushing off school aid payments to the next biennium, by using well, accounting tricks. And, and then you. the last part I just mentioned was uh, two years ago, the last budget was balanced with several billion dollars in one time Federal stimulus aid. All those things, which I believe my colleague mentioned as well, all those things collectively 
added to our problems. What we have tried to identify are possible solutions, and my reforms that we are talking about here today uh, re represent a portion of that. About $1.7 billion worth of savings in the next two years will come from those, but I have got a $3.6 billion deficit, so there are well, other you, things. There are those who suggest that you, you have balanced your budget on the backs of middle class working families, you have cut funding for public education, low cost prescription drugs, and in home health care, and at the same time gave tax breaks to wealthy corporations. How do you justify that position? Well, I would say that is just not true. If you look down the line at the budget we proposed, uh, the biggest beneficiaries of our budget are middle class taxpayers in the State of Wisconsin. Uh, the biggest tax relief we provide is an absolute freeze on the property tax levy in the State of Wisconsin in our budget. That affects middle class taxpayers as much as anybody else out there. Uh, in terms of the middle class, I would contend in our State the middle class are the very people who have been paying the largest share of taxes to pay for the expanse of government in the past. You look at just the numbers, $3.6 billion, our reforms saved $1.7 billion. That means the rest of that uh, nearly $2 billion that has to be balanced come from a variety of other areas. Some of that has come from a reduction of State aid to local governments, but that is because in turn, unlike other States that are cutting aids to local governments, we are actually giving them the tools to balance their budget without massive cuts in service, without massive layoffs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, time is up. I thank the gentleman, the gentlelady from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and the Governor and I have a really long history. We are friends. Uh, I'm crazy about his kids and his wife, but I'm not going to spend my five minutes pretending that we agree on anything. Um, I'm going to start by suggesting um, to you, Governor, that I just don't believe your $3.6 billion structural deficit. Uh, I think that I served on the Finance Committee for many years, and uh, this, this, uh, the, the Chairman has asked the right question, state and local government spending cuts, choice or necessity. Uh, that $3.6 billion structural deficit, uh, deficit I am not going to call it a structural deficit, is simply the difference between what the agencies request and your austere budget. So in between there, there is a lot of debate about whether or not there is a $3.6 billion structural deficit. You know, even when you consider stuff like the Medicaid payment, which was one time only, $169 million, $200 million in that patient's compensation fund that uh, the courts say you got to pay back, uh, but of course that wasn't even in your budget repair bill or the $58 million for the Minnesota Reciprocity Fund, which also was not in your, uh, your uh, um, budget reconciliation bill. Um, the the uh, Fiscal Bureau for current year fiscal uh, uh, 11, you had $121 million in cash, which is not a, a lot of money. So you started out by giving $117 million worth of tax breaks, uh, which uh, reduces revenue for the next fiscal year. And in contrast to giving these uh, wealthy people uh, uh, tax breaks, you cut the earned income tax credit, doubling the taxes on the poorest parents uh, 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 by cutting the earned income tax credit. With respect to collective bargaining, um, you know, you, you said in your testimony that, that folks were running and having a fit to settle contracts that they had been working on for a year. Uh, all 11 examples that you have given uh, were already, make, the members were making concessions around health care, every single one of the 11 people that you raised. You said yourself that the pension fund is 99.67 percent funded. So the question is choice or necessity. And in terms of public workers making more money than the private sector, that is not true. They make 8.2 percent less considering their education and training, and that is what pension funds are, deferred compensation. They have bargained for years for less money in order to have a pension, which is deferred compensation. Now, let me ask you, choice or necessity, did you really have to end Medicaid benefits for dialysis patients or put waiting lists for disabled people who need home health care? 
What in the world does balancing a budget have to do with your program in Milwaukee to expand education vouchers so that the richest person in Milwaukee County can take $6,500 away from the poorest kids in the state for education? What in the world does it have to do with balancing a budget? Um, you, you reinstate the 30-hour work week on welfare recipients, and you tax welfare recipients $20 a month to balance the budget. Transportation. I know you're going to, you would, if there's time, if the chairman is giving time, because I'm using my five minutes to make my statement. You know, you're going to say you gave $410 million to your favorite fund and your favorite folk you love to the highway people. $410 million that governors in the past have rated it for education. You took a billion dollars out of education, which most governors don't do, but you didn't do it for transit. There are 12 communities in Wisconsin that give 24 million rides a year that are going to suffer because of what you've done. And you know, you're going to lose $46 million in federal funding because you've taken collective bargaining away, and that's against federal law. And so, you know, Governor, I, I, I asked the question, if you have time to answer, state and local government spending cuts, choice, or necessity, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, would the gentlelady yield for a question? Uh, yeah, I have 10 seconds left. Well, in that 10 seconds, what Federal law requires collective bargaining and would, would you the, lose the, money the, over uh, it? Transportation, uh, there is a transportation prohibition against, uh, we, have, we have communities in Wisconsin that provide public transportation, and you have to have public uh, workers, collective bargaining agreements in place in order to get the trans, uh, transit reimbursement. Excellent. Would the gentlelady be willing to put that in the record, the, yes. uh, the data supporting it? Thank you. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. And I thank our two governors. Uh, uh, members, left and right, have a lot of unanswered questions, but only because many of us spent too much time not asking the questions. And in some cases, we simply ran out of time. So I would ask both the governors if you with the aid of your staff, would mind answering some supplemental questions from the committee. Let the record show you have uh, answered in the affirmative, which I appreciate. Additionally, at the beginning, we uh, received general leave for you to add additional information that you choose to, perhaps ex expanding on any answers you gave or providing supplemental information. I thank you again. This has been great for the committee and, uh, and I am sure good for those who took the time to watch or to attend. With that, we stand recessed until about 10 minutes after the last vote.